My name is Max, and I want to start a new nano-industrial revolution with single wall carbon nanotubes. But you might ask, what are carbon nanotubes? Where do they come from? What makes them interesting? And why should this topic be pursued with any vigor? Carbon nanotubes are an allotrope of carbon, an allotrope being an ordered atomic structure. And for a long time, the only two known allotropes of carbon were diamond and graphite. However, not so long ago, three new allotropes of carbon have been discovered. And these are the Buckminster fluorine, the carbon nanotube, and graphene. And these three represent a very interesting and different set of materials than diamond and graphite. Now if we look at the structure of graphite, what you will see is that it's made out of many ordered uh, planes or sheets of carbon. Uh, similar to a stack of paper. And each one of the, the sheets of graphite is covalently bonded and very, very strong. But the bond between the sheets is quite weak. It's, it's by weak van der Waals forces. As such, these sheets can separate or cleave quite easily. Now, if we keep cleaving away at these sheets, eventually we'll get to one sheet or one plane that's one atom thick of carbon. Uh, this is graphene. In fact, this is how graphene was originally made, by cleaving away at the sheets of graphite. Uh, and this is covalently bonded, and it's a very strong structure. And if we take this sheet, if we take this sheet and successfully roll it into a tube, we will have a carbon nanotube. And if we also take this sheet and kind of, if these your imagination a little, uh, make it into a, a sphere, that would be the Buckminster fullerene. Now nanotubes can present themselves in several different forms, specifically um, single-walled and multi-walled nanotubes. I'm only interested in the single-walled nanotubes because I think they're far more interesting, uh, they're also stronger, they are also harder to manufacture. Now if we look at our single-walled carbon nanotube, this is a structure that has a diameter of somewhere slightly less than one nanometer and perhaps as much as two nanometers. Uh, its walls are one carbon atom thick. Uh, and this is an ordered graphitic structure. However, its length can be very, very long. Uh, in excess of a meter has been grown successfully. Uh, furthermore, depending on how you twist this carbon sheet, you know, this way or perhaps this way, it'll affect its properties. This is known as chirality. So what makes these things interesting? Fullerenes and nanotubes represent a whole new world of effectively organic chemistry being a carbon-carbon bond. This is a whole new field of science waiting to be explored along with its resultant technology that can be used to build a whole new economy just as steel and aluminum were used to build whole new economies in the last two centuries. Now nanotubes have many very interesting properties. For one, they are the strongest material known and might be the strongest material possible. A recent article just from a few weeks ago in Nature, a group in Japan, the, they had a very slick setup where they could grow an individual nanotube and measured stem cell strength by CVD methods. Um, their results were that the armchair chirality nanotubes had a tensile strength about 65 gigapascals. Steel is about half a gigapascal and Kevlar is about one gigapascal. So given the nanotubes are a sixth of the density of steel, that would mean the nanotubes are 65 times 2 times 6 or close to, according to their calculation, 700 plus times better than an equivalent weight of steel. And the authors acknowledge that this doesn't even represent its cell strength and that stronger nanotubes are quite possible. I would say that's pretty good. Now if you work at Kickstarter in Brooklyn, you've probably been either on the Brooklyn or the Verrazano Narrows Bridge uh, or one of the other big suspension bridges in the New York area. And 150 years ago, when the steel cables needed to build them were cutting edge technology, suspension bridges of the sort were marvels of the architect's art. Now imagine if the huge cables that hold them up would be 500 or even a thousand times thinner. What kind of architecture could we build with that? Nanotubes are also high temperature materials. 
while they will oxidize at about 700 or so degrees Celsius, similar to graphite, um, if you did cover them with a protective coating, for example, silicon carbide or perhaps thin film of diamond, uh, they can withstand much higher temperatures, close to 3,000 degrees Celsius. Furthermore, the thermal conductivity of nanotubes is at least that, but most likely quite a, significantly better than copper. Uh, now, as an example of where this would be very useful is if you look at the Concorde, you know, the, the only real useful supersonic transport that was ever employed, at least with any commercial success, uh, its top speed was limited actually by the surface heating of the leading edges uh, due to drag. So this excess heat contributed to the loss of fatigue strength and shortened the life of the aircraft. So if you went too, too fast, it would overheat and make, become a lot weaker. Um, the SR-71 famously had fuel recirculating on its leading edges, which were actually made out of titanium, and that was quite new at the time, to allow it to fly in excess of Mach 3. Uh, nanotubes could make that uh, thermal management so much easier. They could withstand higher temperatures. They're also a lot stronger, and they conduct heat a lot better. So you can build far more interesting, far more higher performing things. And since you know nanotubes are that much stronger, you would need a lot less of them. The other big point that I think should not be underestimated, and I'd like to make, is that nanotubes of all sorts are man-made materials. In my approach, you just need graphite and electricity. Uh, compare that to current mining practices. For example, the Birmingham Canyon mine in Utah is the largest open pit mine in the USA. Uh, it's been producing copper for the last 100 or so years, and it's still profitable. It is a 2,000 acre hole in the ground that is more than half a mile deep. Uh, how much effort did that take to make? Uh, and one would be hard to press to imagine a more environmentally destructive thing than a 2,000 acre, half a mile deep hole in the ground and its resulting tailings, pollution, and everything else that comes with it. Nanotubes are a path to make that obsolete. Another big aspect of nanotubes that I would like to c uh, cover is that everyone seems to be obsessed with energy production. But I don't think that's the, the only or even the most important metric. Now, what separates us from animals? The ability to concentrate energy. Uh, since the development of fire, every big step in human development is related to that. Uh, for example, steam power allowed us to move past draft animals. Um, and as such, I think an overlooked metric is energy density and it related to efficiency. Ask yourself, all else being equal, would you rather have a car with 20 horsepower or 200 horsepower? And that's the difference between a Ford Model T and a modern compact car, both of which, by the way, use similar amounts of fuel. So perhaps instead of obsessing where we're going to get more energy and, and how we're going to produce it, per perhaps we could focus on efficiency and energy density. I mean, what if we could make everything a lot lighter? That would be a huge improvement. And this is what's possible with nanotubes, while being infinitely better for the environment and delivering far better performance. And another idea on the similar topic is that I'd like to address, which I've heard a lot from supposedly smart people, is the idea of asteroid mining. And the thought is that somewhere out there in the ether, many millions of miles away, uh, are huge chunks of iron and nickel possibly in the multi-ton, million-ton range that are just floating around for anyone interested to drag back to Earth, place it into orbit, and chip away as needed. Um, even after having spent more time in academia than I will admit to being alive, this is probably the most stupid and ridiculous idea I've ever heard of, worthy of the best lunatics in any asylum. First off, assuming we have the means to do this, why does anyone think it would be cheaper than mining here? You would still need hundreds, if not thousands, of workers in space. And at a lunch price of, you know, currently about $1,000 a kilogram, what would a steak dinner for one of them cost? And let's say your, you know, let's say your ratchet breaks. Uh, today, you can just call Snap-on. They'll come over to your, to your shop and fix it for you. 
will they do that for your space mine? Or what if you have an accident and you have to go to the hospital? Second, space junk and debris is a, a huge problem today. Uh, are, we not to are we to believe that not a single piece from this multi-million ton chunk will ever be lost and become a hazard in outer space, thereby forming more space pollution? Uh, it, it's just moving pollution from the surface to, to, the, to orbit. It's not any better. And would this monstrosity have any other environmental effects? Would it alter the gravitational pull that the moon exerts on the tides? What would happen if it ever deorbits? Uh, while that may not end all life on Earth, I think that would be a very significant and little impact on our environment that should be carefully considered. And what effort would all of that accomplish? While it might, in some theory, make metals cheaper, it won't give you anything better. You would still have the same stuff. You would still have the same capabilities. You would still require the same methods to make things, which wouldn't be any better. Nanotubes are far better, cleaner. We can make them here on Earth without going, you know, 100 million miles somewhere. We don't need mining. And if we want to move forward, this is the most this is the best and most interesting path that can be taken. So where do all these wonderful things come from? Modern history of nanotechnology can perhaps be traced to about 1970 when a Japanese scientist by the name of Eiji Osawa predicted and accurately calculated a new form of carbon, uh, a new allotrope, and he proposed that a structure of carbon can exist that is a hollow closed sphere of 60 carbon atoms uh, and it resembles a soccer ball but it's also very similar to the building structures of the architect Buckminster Fuhrer. So a few years later around 1984-1985 a group of scientists led by uh, Rick Smalley uh, with, along with Harry Crota and Robert Curl were working on an interesting project at Rice University. Uh, Dr. Smalley and Curl uh, they had a machine which used a laser to evaporate a sample and produce a vapor of the sample inside a vacuum chamber. Uh, lasers were still pretty new at that point, especially ones that could deliver enough power to evaporate, uh, for example, a germanium or silicon or a carbon target. So Dr. Smalley's machine had two instruments. One, an infrared spectroscope and the second, a mass spectrometer. And Harry Croto suggested that they use it to evaporate carbon. And the idea was that you would produce a carbon vapor and you could measure its composition with the mass spectrometer and you would also have a corresponding optical signal from the infrared spectrometer. Now, you might ask what the market value of such things is. Well, there isn't. But the value of this is that you could ta then take an image of a carbon-rich star or some other carbon-rich celestial body uh, and look at its infrared signature and then compare it to a known and measured infrared signature of carbon vapor and you can determine the composition of this uh, celestial body even though it, it might be millions of light years away. And so while there's no market for such things this is actually very useful in enriching our understanding of the universe. Um, in case you ever wondered how to measure the composition of a carbon-rich star. So when they ran their experiment, they, what they were expecting to see were long chains of carbon, uh, something like C5 through maybe C12 or C13, which would basically be a, a string of carbon atoms, 5 to 12 or so atoms long. But to their big surprise, they saw two peaks on the mass spectrometer, one at 720 and one at 840. Well, they had nothing but carbon in their system, and if you divide 720 by 12, the atomic mass of carbon, you would get C60 and then 840 would get you C70. Uh, completely not what they were expecting. However, they were smart guys. They were really smart guys. And they knew what they would found, and that was the experimental proof of a new allotrope of carbon as by, predicted by our friend earlier. And they de deemed it the Buckminster Fluorine after the architect Buckminster Fuhrer. And for their efforts, they won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1996 and opened up a whole new field of scientific study. Unfortunately, Dr. Smalley's machine 
could not make macroscopic samples. While they could observe fullerenes, they could not make enough of them to actually study them any further. So a few years later in Germany, Dr. Wolfgang Kratzmer and his associates, they made fullerenes for the first time on a macroscopic scale by evaporating carbon with a plasma arc. And their apparatus consisted of two graphite electrodes, with a small gap between them, and they would let a plasma arc, just like if you can imagine if you took an ordinary stick welder but with two carbon electrodes, and then they evaporated the carbon inside a bell jar in a helium atmosphere, and the resulting soot contains fullerenes. And one interesting property of fullerenes that they discovered is that it can dissolve in organic solvents unlike any other form of carbon. So if you take fluorine soot and you mix it with say toluene, the fluorines will dissolve and the other carbons won't. So you can then just filter out the amorphous carbon, evaporate the solvent, you get high purity fluorines. And no other form of carbon has this property. So by using carbon arcs, fluorines could be made for the first time in gram quantities and their property study. About the same time, uh, a Japanese scientist by the name of Sumujima, uh, he found evidence of multi-wall tubes on the cathode side of the carbon arc. And, you know, similar setup as used by Kratzmer. And he described it as multi-layer graphitic fiber structures with uh, similar two fullerenes, therefore officially discovering carbon nanotubes. Uh, that last point, though, however, is extremely contentious and highly debated. Quite a few other people may have observed and described nanotubes without perhaps maybe making the leap to call them nanotubes, going back to at least the 1950s. So there's a few other contenders for the prize, including Marine Bo Endo from Japan, who grew effectively nanotubes and described it almost as such in the, starting in the 70s by CVD methods. Uh, there's a few other people from the Soviet Union, a few other people from the USA, uh, that predate the Jima by at least a few years, if not decades. Interesting point in the history of nanotubes is that TM analysis of old swords, particularly uh, from Damascus and wood steel, have found that they do contain uh, nanotubes. And, you know, and these swords predate the modern era by quite a few years. Now, controversies aside, uh, Smalley's, Jima's, and Kratzmer's publications spurred a lot of research and a lot of interest into this new field of study. And some small-scale production of fullerenes and nanotubes uh, started in the 90s, uh, leading to a great interest in other nano-sized materials about the same time. Uh, unfortunately, sometime in the early 2000s, a lot of this interest and in funding for such things seems to have dried up. And research, particularly into their synthesis, uh, has kind of dried up. Now today, you can buy commercially available fullerenes and nanotubes. Uh, Multi-wall nanotubes are easier to make, and I've seen prices as low as a few dollars a gram, uh, although I'm not quite sure what quality that is. Uh, Single-wall carbon nanotubes are far more difficult to make. And as such, their prices reflect that and start at, uh, I've seen about $50 a gram and up, way up. And factors include length, purity, amount of residual catalyst, uh, and how they're made. So how are nanotubes made? Well, the basic premise is this. Uh, if you start with a, a metal catalyst, and you would need one of a small size, perhaps a few nanometers for single wall carbon nanotubes. And you need to place this into a carbon-rich atmosphere. And then the free-floating carbon vapor would be absorbed by a droplet here. Um, then it would be ordered and form a cap coming out of this droplet. And then this, cap, uh, this droplet would act as a machine. And by taking the free-floating carbon vapor, adding this cap, thereby growing an ordered nanotube. So how can this effect be accomplished on a practical scale? Well, there's actually many different approaches and people have tried many different things. Uh, one method is we can you do is laser ablation, similar to Dr. Smalley's original setup. Uh, in order this, to do this, you would need a, a large laser and evaporate some graphite with a little metal mixed in. Uh, and this method makes very high quality and high purity nanotubes. 
Unfortunately, lasers are expensive and not very efficient. Uh, for example, for on a lab scale, a laser for this purpose, you would need something like a YG laser. Uh, you would put out between half and maybe one watt of actual light power. This would also consume between three and five kilowatts of input power. And the, as you can imagine, the equipment involved is quite expensive. And yield might be in the order of 50 to maybe 250 milligrams an hour. So it's not quite industrial production. Now you might ask, why not just get a bigger laser? Well, the kind of laser that would get you maybe 100 grams an hour of evaporation would probably be big enough to fry a tank. The other method, which is probably the most widely used for such things, is something called chemical vapor deposition, or CVD for short. Uh, CVD is a very broad field, and saying CVD is saying something like machining or cooking. Um, and CVD is a very large, mature industry, and it's, it comes with many variations, and it's commonly used to make thin layers of things, primarily for electronics and surface finishes. So the monitor you're watching this on, the microchips in your computer and phone, are made by CVD methods. My experience in this field was building research equipment for thin film solar cells, which use silicon hydride gas uh, called silane or SIH4 to grow thin film crystalline solar cells. So how does CVD work? Um, the basic premise of CVD is that if you take a gas feedstock and then break it down into its elemental components, they then become reactive. Uh, so one example that's widely used uh, is CVD for growing microchips and a lot of microchips are made from silicon so you would want to grow silicon layers. Um, in one variation of this you would flow for example uh, you would flow silane into a vacuum chamber which would have a microwave plasma in it. The plasma would then crack or break down the silane into its silicon and hydrogen uh, components. The silicon can then attach itself to a substrate and grow a silicon layer. Now, if you want to alter the silicon, then you can also introduce what are called dopants, for example, arsenic or phosphine in their uh, hydride forms, arsenic and phosphine. And then you could then grow silicon layers with different properties, which then make microchips, flat panel displays, transistors, uh, solar cells, and things of the sort. Similarly, CVD can also be used to make nanotubes. Now, for nanotubes, uh, you would need a carbon-rich gas, and then also we would need our metal catalyst. And typically, for the gas, you would use something like methane or acetylene, and for the catalyst, this becomes a little tricky, but one version is if you take a uh, say silicon wafer, deposit some iron or nickel on it and then etch it to produce a series of very small dots. Each dot ideally would be just in a few nanometers range. And then in order to grow the nanotubes you would place your silicon substrate with the metal catalyst inside a, uh, a tube furnace for example at about maybe 700 or more degrees Celsius flow your carbon rich gas, methane or acetylene, into it, the gas would then crack or break down into its carbon and hydrogen components, and then the metal dots on our substrate would then absorb the carbon and grow nanotubes. One big advantage of this method is that you can grow nanotubes wherever you can place your metal catalyst. Uh, in fact, you can grow one single carbon nanotubes where you would want it. This is quite useful if you want to make uh, things like electronics or perhaps sensors. There are a few drawbacks to CVD methods. One, making the right catalyst to grow single wall carbon nanotubes can be quite challenging. Uh, second, the growth rate is quite small, perhaps a few grams an hour. Um, the actual quality in terms of diameter and the amount of defects is subject to some debate, but I think it could be a little better. Um, now, people claim to make multi-wall nanotubes by this method by the ton. Uh, I'm a little skeptical if that's actually a thing, what they get out and how useful it might be. 
Now the method I'm most familiar with and would like to use is the arc plasma method. Similar to apparatus used by Kratchmer. Uh, so in this method, as mentioned earlier, one would take two graphite electrodes uh, and then light an arc between the two of them, uh, similar to what you might do with welding. The resulting vapor will then grow very high quality nanotubes with narrow diameters, very few structural defects. Unfortunately, standard arc plasma has two big disadvantages. For the first disadvantage is that lighting plasma arcs over about one or maybe two kilowatts and using electrodes bigger than about a quarter inch just doesn't work. Um, the process breaks down, the plasma doesn't want to stay lit, and if you just crank up the power it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill your process, it doesn't work. The second problem with the arc plasma method is that while the nanotubes themselves are of very high quality, the purity of the resultant soot is quite low. You know, you're only going to have about 10, maybe 20 percent actual nanotubes in it, the rest being amorphous carbon. And separating the two is very difficult, if not impossible. And there's no good method for it. And any method that is known today will generally damage the tubes in at least some capacity. Now, I would like to use arc plasma methods to solve the problem of nanotube production. Um, one of the problems, the scalability problems, is has been solved. And I currently have the proprietary technology know-how to run an arc of any size. And this has been tested for fluorine production. And I think it's reasonable to assume a machine could be built and run and evaporate graphite to 40, perhaps 50 kilowatts without any issues. The second problem of purity is with the one that I would like to address with the funds from this campaign. Can an arc plasma machine be built that will produce high purity single carbon nanotubes with a little amorphous soot? I think it's very possible. However, these ideas must be tested experimentally and there are many unknowns at the moment and it's quite possible that my ideas are wrong but I think they would be wrong for reasons that are not currently known and understood. So even if the machine does not produce nanotubes, I think the knowledge that will come out of it would be quite useful. And this is what I ask for your help for, to conduct a science experiment to see if high quality, high purity nanotubes can be grown by this approach. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it answers all your questions on nanotechnology. And thank you for checking out my Kickstarter. I think nanotubes are an important so far missing part in the next steps of humanity and I hope to see your name on the backers list. Thanks so much and let's build the world of the future starting today.